Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to Brandwatch's webinar, uh, Technology as a Tool for Change, Integrating Social Intelligence at IKEA. My name is Joel Windles, and I'm the Marketing Manager for EMEA, and I'm joined by Glenn White, who's our Head of Product at Brandwatch, and Hans Gartner, who is part of the Digital Development Team at Inter IKEA. Now, we're going to be talking about uh, with those two guys later on, um, and this is a slightly different type of webinar that we've done before, so um, come along with us, and we're going to be setting up at the beginning by saying what it's all about. So that begins with the state of the social business, followed by how command centers plays a role in that. And then we're going to get to the meat of the webinar, which is talking with Hans and Glenn about how they've actually seen this in practice. So I'm going to be talking with you for about five minutes. And then we're going to be going straight into the Q&A, where I'll introduce them to both properly. Don't be shy. We would love your participation. So you can tweet with the hashtag BrandWatchTips, or you can just tweet straight to our handle, which is at BrandWatch, and ask questions and get involved as we're going along. We really want this to be a conversational-style webinar rather than us just talking at you. Also, um, we're going to be recording this webinar, so if you're interested in watching the video after the event, especially if some of your colleagues couldn't make it, then we'll be sending that round as well as download of the slide. So we're just going to get into the state of social business. Now, lots of the people on this webinar will be interested into thinking, okay, well, what is the state of social business? How is social playing a role in businesses across the world? Now, if we re rewind the clock a bit, we'll see social media first starting to be used inside organizations. Now, when I see this, I like to think of telephone technology or email or even web pages. When you get these emergent technologies, it's very hard to understand what role they'll play inside an organization, especially when so much is not known about them yet. So returning to the telephone analogy, you might have seen companies, perhaps the customer service team, starting to allow customers to call them up but then the sales team says, well, maybe we could use telephones. Maybe we could allow people to get involved in promotions and buy products specifically using a telephone. And social media has followed this curve. So it's followed this kind of idea of bottom-up technology. The difficulty with social media, of course, is that it's not just Twitter. It's not just Facebook. It's a number of different websites, and they're completely out of the control of an organization. So this is really throwing up some challenges that we've never really seen before. So early stage social business would look something like this. We'll see maybe someone in the market research team, maybe a couple of people within marketing, maybe even the, uh, the customer service team starting to think, okay, well, how does social media play a role in what we do in our jobs? And these evangelists will start to say, look, I'm going to start using Twitter as a customer service channel. I'm going to start listening to what people are saying on Twitter to inform our market research. But at this early stage, it's still very disparate, and people aren't really communicating. They're doing their own thing within their own teams. Ideally, an organization will want to um, get to the next level, which is a cross-functional team, like this. And this is where the people embracing social within marketing might meet up with the people inside customer service and, cut, and inside market research and any other team that's starting to kind of experiment with what social can offer. Now, when you get these heads together, they start to share ideas. They might even share technologies but it's still not a centralized structure. So the next level inside a social organization would be to establish a center of excellence. Now, companies will call these things all sorts of um, different names, but ultimately it's a central hub within a company that tries to establish the best practices. It tries to say, okay, well, in marketing, we're using this tone, we're using these networks, we're following these processes. How can those uh, learnings and those kind of ideas really make it across the organization, and how can we start to use it in all of these different channels. So we might have dedicated social employees for the first time when we establish a sense of excellence. We might have social insights team members, or maybe we'll have half of customer service team's time, half of marketing's time. The idea is that this sense of excellence is embracing and adopting all of these changing technologies into one central hub. Now, the truly social intelligent business it is something of a buzzword, but the idea behind this fourth stage is that the company is using social media in an intelligent way. So it's using it in a sophisticated way. It's using it in a consistent way. And every time there's an advancement in one of these departments, one of these silos, that, that knowledge is being shared across the organization. So this is where we see companies operating very efficiently 
and much more usefully from a consumer's point of view. So how do we get there? It's very, very difficult to start with a couple of people inside the organization who think Twitter is going to be pretty big to being an organization where the entire C-suite and the social media managers and the customer service reps and every single person in the organization is really clear and understanding on how social plays a role in the work that they do. So that road is a hard one and, and very few companies have got all the way to the end. And what we're going to be discussing today is how do you get from that siloed information, how do you get from marketing and customer service doing stuff to being that level four? So uh, one of the barriers is the fact that it is siloed. Organize it, within organizations, departments don't always share information. The flow of data doesn't always get into the right hands. It can stay in inboxes. It can stay in PDFs. And of course, the lack of resources. Most people have a job to be getting on with. And throwing something new and untested into the formula can actually be very dang oh, not dangerous, but very daunting and can, find, can be hard to find the time for. How can that be quicker? How can it be catalyzed, if you like? Well, it's about making it easily digestible. If you've got a 40-page report on what customers are saying on Facebook, it's not as useful as something that can um, quickly digest it and make it applicable to a specific team. So um, making it easily digestible using dashboards and visual informa information is, is crucial. But also creating a culture of sharing. So how can you get the CMO and the CFO speaking the same language and understanding the same amount of value in these technologies and processes. So step forward command centers. So some people in the audience might not know specifically what command centers are and what they do. So I'm going to give a very quick overview. But the idea is that they are physical things in the real world, so they're not in, in, in inboxes or stuck in PDFs. But they're a physical thing that actually shows the information that's happening online and brings it into the real office space or headquarters or lobbies. And I'm just going to take you through a few of the examples of how some of the brands that we work with are using these command centers, um, especially with regard to that journey that um, I just took you on. So the first one would be customer service. So we have some companies that work with us that use huge, huge displays in front of their customer service team. And the information, the tweets that people are saying, the posts they're putting on Facebook groups, are actually being manifested on these giant screens in front of the people that are expected to respond to them. And by surfacing the most interesting queries, the most pressing complaints, the most important um, questions that customers might have, the actual speed and efficiency that the customer service team are operating on massively improve. We're also seeing crisis management um, be streamlined and optimized to a degree that we've never really seen before. So, by having uh, a visual representation of when a crisis begins to unfold. If you have a screen in the room that physically starts to you know, flash red or, or you know, something similar, when people start saying things they shouldn't be online or your product starts breaking in a, in a way that you hadn't anticipated, then it really uh, gets to the right people far, far quicker than it would if it was just a simple email. Real-time marketing, too, we're seeing um, brands, maybe at the Super Bowl, for example, or other huge events, actually using command centers or visual displays to, again, surface the most important and insightful things that they can act upon almost instantly. And I am going to refrain from mentioning the Oreo Super Bowl tweet, but it's that kind of thing. Then we're seeing three more use cases that are more orientated towards improving the efficiency of the business rather than the consumer. So we're seeing regional benchmarking. Sometimes we've got brands with you know 12 displays in their offices, each displaying a, a specific region of what people are talking about with regard to their products or their campaigns and their messaging. And this is a really nice snapshot way to see which things are resonating with which groups of consumers. Competitive benchmarking is a very, a benchmarking is a very similar thing where we have um, some organizations have these huge screens as they come into the office every day. And what they're seeing as they walk past is, OK, what are people talking about us? What are people talking about our competitors? So if you're an airline, for example, what happens when everybody's saying great things about your competitor? That might be a thing that you wouldn't have otherwise reached everyone in your organization. And the last thing, which is you know, clearly what this webinar is focused on, which is driving social awareness. How can we get what people are saying online to reach the people that are actually working inside that company? How can we make the company realize the potential and the impact that social media is having? So, 
that's my bet. Um, I hope that wasn't too long for you, but here we're going to kind of dissect some of those issues because clearly there were far more challenges than I went into detail over and far more um, concerns and interesting topic points that we could go into. So I'm joined, as I say, by Hans Gartner, who is Swedish and has been spent most of his career working all around the world. His background is in international business and he joined the Inter-IKEA team as part of its digital division in the Netherlands at the start of this year. He's joined by Glenn White, who has an agency background but has been our head of product at Brownwatch for almost three years now and was the man or the brains behind Vizier, which is Brownwatch's command center product. So, um, if you'd like to say hello and, uh, and <laughs> announce yourselves to everybody. Yeah. Hello, Joel. Thanks for the introduction. And you, Glenn? Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Glenn, head of product as Joel said. So, I'm just going to get straight into the questions now. And I think the first thing which I think is probably worth framing the entire conversation around is that um, the organizational structure at IKEA is not as simple as you might think. So, Hans, I was wondering if you could share with everyone just very quickly about how the organization is set up at IKEA. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really key to, to uh, for me to give a little bit of an um, uh, in-depth analysis into that. And it's actually something that I think few people in the outside world uh, have uh, decent insights into. Uh, so I work for the inter Systems Office located here in Delft in Holland. And uh, the reason why we sit down here is obviously for tax evasion purposes. I think maybe some of you listening into this have probably caught a few of the headlines in the in the in the news in the last couple of days, there's been a peak on social, for example, uh, talking about multinationals in, in general in regard to having had a tax base set up uh, using Holland, Belgium, and, uh, and Luxembourg as the the seat for this. So I represent an office, a an organization with the franchise over with the owner uh, of the IKEA concept, and we bought the IKEA brand about two three years ago for about nine billion euros. So we we produce marketing materials, we set the framework for how all the retailers uh, across the globe work. Uh, there are currently about 365 uh, retailers uh, operating in about 45 different countries. And to be a little bit more clear about who who does what within the franchisee division, it's 85% uh, of the 365 uh, retailers is operated and owned by the IKEA group of companies. So clearly, the other it's, you know, it's, it's a really big company. It's a very complex organization with all sorts of different franchises and independent retailers pulling part of the same group. So what was the state of social like inside the organization when you began? Like, how was social media being administered and used across these different disparate parts of the business? Yes, so I joined the company about nine months ago. And uh, what I quickly discovered when I was uh, taking part in a uh, larger, more uh, global social media uh, direction, uh, I found out that there's a lot of different scattered initiatives uh, around the world and different retailers uh, run social media initiatives on many, many different levels. So the maturity varies quite a bit. Uh, for obvious reasons, we do see IKEA in the USA are quite forward thinking in general when it comes to social media, uh, somewhat closely followed by the Dutch organization to some extent Sweden and also the UK. But in general, there's a lot of different scattered initiatives and we don't have a, any specific homogeneous way of, uh, of working with social business intelligence. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's something we've noticed too. Glenn, I'm not sure if you've seen a difference between different regions in how they approach social media or not. I think, I think we do see different differences across the regions, but I think company culture tends to be more important. I mean, most companies are so, Global and large, anyway. But I do think you see a difference between Northern European, um, the Eastern, and then the American types of country. So, is part of the objective at IKEA, Hans, to make it so that all regions are working in the same way, or is it so that America can show the other regions how how best to do it, or is there a, a, a wider strategy than that? Uh, well, we're currently we're currently working on a, on a larger, more global strategy in regard to social media. But uh, you know, I have to be very honest and direct. Uh, this is IKEA. You know, I mean, you go to the retail stores and you're still picking up a pen and paper. So it's a very analog company in a lot of ways, and certainly not fast moving by any means. 
So we have for the past year and a half actually been looking at how do we approach social media and uh, how do we approach it from a governance perspective, uh, you know, considering the role that the inter system office has it from here. So we, we do look to different regions who tend to be quite forward thinking in this space, who take good initiatives, and we try to build case studies uh, from this and uh, are working on uh, setting a, a framework for how other retailers could potentially implement and use these different initiatives. So what, I mean, what do you think the main things you did want to change were? Because clearly governance is going to play a major role in this, but what things did you want to see as an outcome? So let's say a year down the line, what were you trying to get out of this endeavor? Well, I think it's really important. This is a, a personal take on it, um, considering my background and a little bit. I've been working with a lot of startup companies before, and so I do come from an environment where there's been a lot of entrepreneurial uh, mindsets uh, incorporated into these uh, into the uh, culture that I've been working with. So I'm really kind of hoping that we IKEA here, uh, the, the office that I represent, don't take too too strict of a control governance on the things uh, in the social business intelligence space, but rather try to set a fairly general uh, framework and you know make a decision on the different kinds of tools that we could work with. I think everybody listening in on this will probably agree to the fact that it's quite important that you, you streamline certain things, but that you move away from the control aspect. I think a lot of brands, and I know specifically IKEA, uh, are uh, to some extent viewing social business intelligence in the way that, okay, how do we control this? How can we keep an eye on that, and how can we steer this in a certain direction? And for me, social media is just really all about letting go of the control, you know, and uh, just kind of working with... Uh, social business intelligence as a free-floating kind of a force, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. So, I mean, striking that balance between having control and making sure nothing goes wrong, but allowing different departments and teams and individuals to operate in the way that social media was designed for. I mean, I think that's a challenge lots of companies face. But how about the political side of things? So how do you ensure that people across the organization, especially the more senior staff, buy into the value of this? Like, is it worth investing in? Yeah, so that's a, that's a bit of a tough nut to crack here within the key organization because of the, because of how I was explaining in the beginning here, the, how the different companies within IKEA are organized, uh, we do have quite a bit of struggle uh, because this office that I represent once again is the franchise of the IKEA concept, so it's our responsibility to kind of write the rules and the guidelines for how we do certain things. Uh, but then also because our biggest franchisee is uh, the IKEA group of companies, also called the Inca group. So they have supporting business units and they have people in place who are also working on different kinds of social media initiatives. So it's quite actually difficult to kind of map out and get an idea of the different, uh, uh, the different initiatives that different people have in different supporting business units to the IKEA group of companies. So uh, we're working with that parallel to, to other things at this point in time, but the political complexity due to the organizational setup is certainly difficult for us to, to overcome and something we're putting a lot, I'm putting a lot of effort into that right now. Yeah, I can imagine. And um, Glenn, I'd quite like to ask you, you know, if you're seeing a company saying we need something that will help us embrace social, that will help get buy-in from different departments, where are you seeing that innovation driven from? Which teams, which departments, which individuals inside a company are helping drive this change? I still, I still think a lot of this comes from marketing still as a sort of driving force in the business because they're kind of the front line of seeing, seeing the social data and they are probably the first people to recognize the implications and the benefits it can bring to other departments. They're seeing product feedback, they're seeing customer complaints, they're seeing sales opportunities that they can take to these other departments. So. I still see marketing as a driving force, but it often is a champion inside the business that finds this uh, and drives it forward. And that's kind of where you see that center of excellence coming to play of that person driving change across the organization. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense to me. And, you know, I'm marketers, of course, with the most uh, pioneering intelligent department of any organization. <laughs> but uh, how do command centers play a role in this? So if you've got a central uh, hub, a center of excellence, if you like, how important is a command center in that whole process and the visual side of things? I think I think one of the things you struggle most of, or people struggle most of, in in trying to convince people how useful this information is, is that in the old old days, and we're talking a couple of years ago here now, that it took a while to get people the information. Right? You you maybe you find some interesting stuff, you write a report, you send it to someone, it's a few hours old, 
at best, there's probably a few days old, was the visualizations. You can actually bring this stuff to life for people. It's not a static report they get curated by someone. It's a screen they look at, information's coming in that's relevant to them that they can use and take back. And they start understanding the power and they start asking more questions then. Oh, can you set up to this? Can you show me what people are saying about this part of the product right now? Can you show me where are these leads coming from? And by having that kind of live feed of things, it really gives them a sense of ownership and understanding they don't get when it's curated by a kind of central body. Yeah, I, th I think that's an important point. And, you know, actually seeing the warts and all, actually seeing the bad parts rather than just the parts that people maybe want you to see is quite crucial. And are you seeing a difference, Hans, um, at IKEA from the moment you started visualizing this information compared to when it was just stuck in reports and inboxes? Uh, yeah, so when we, when we had the, uh, the Visia set up uh, over in IT department, it was uh, implemented more like an, uh, in a stealth mode. So one of the challenges that I had uh, since I was running the project was really getting the right stakeholders involved uh, at an early stage and exposing them to the, the different screens and obviously really explaining carefully to what it is that they're reviewing on the different screens. So I, I really made an effort to not to bring too many people into a PowerPoint meeting for two hours discussing in theory, but really try to put an effort into making it as tangible as possible for these people and, and letting them know about the different opportunities that a, a more um, action-oriented uh, type of environment, so what that could actually mean for a brand like IKEA. So, yeah, so I mean, how did you decide then, you know, what gets shown on the screen because clearly you can't show everything that's interesting and insightful. What, how did you come to decide which things were worth visualizing and bringing to the fore? Yeah, that was, uh, that was one, one of the things that I was thinking quite early on and, and uh, as you are also know, Joel, when, we, when I started this project, you know, having come from a lot of different startup environments, I know from experience that rather than producing different PowerPoints going into long meetings, I'm a bit more action oriented and I think it's important to actually start working on a project, you know, bringing it up to, to, to real life and to show people what it is and, and what it can actually do for them. So um, we had not really a clear agenda, to be honest with you, when I started the project. I had a kind of a rough idea what I wanted to do and what social business intelligence could provide for a business and it's just specifically a big brand like IKEA. So we started off on a more general scale, you know, we wanted to stream uh, a little bit of the Twitter feeds, you know, we're working with the global English language, so we're talking about the US, Canada, UK, and Australia first and foremost, and obviously also people speaking English in the different countries other than that. So we started off with uh, Instagram, Pinterest, we started, uh, you know, streaming actually Instagram was kind of interesting, and, and Pinterest, uh, uh, because it gave an opportunity for a specific stakeholder here within my office, who is a senior manager for home furnishing, it gave her uh, real insights to life at home for our consumers and customers talking about IKEA online. So, uh, you know, I had an hour conversation with her in regard to how you could work with social business intelligence. And all these conversations I had with different stakeholders resulted in me, uh, along with the consultant that I, uh, from the socializers that I work with, to actually uh, streamline and tweak things as we went along. So, we started off on a pretty broad scale. It's actually responding to things, you know, as they're happening, and I can imagine people changing the way they work like that, which is really part of the point of doing this. And we actually have a question from Twitter. We have a few coming in. We'll try and get around to them all, but one of them is um, from Elizabeth Solomon, who's asked, how do you see social media command centers changing uh, ways of thinking that people on, that see it change on a daily basis? So uh, I'm going to pass this one over to Glenn, but how can people actually change the way they work on a day-to-day -day basis? thanks to these command centers. I think one of the things we see with, with teams that are set up, we have a lot of companies using Visio who set themselves up with a big command center in a room, loads of screens, all this data come in, and they're working in front of that. And what it's doing is it's giving them that live insight into actually what's happening right now. It's not just an email that comes in or a notification that pops up. It's right there in front of them. So they're constantly reminded of it. It keeps them in that space of thinking what are the customers thinking now? What do they care about? What's happening? What do I need to be, be looking at right now? And I think that's, that's really powerful because what it's doing is it's taking people away from this kind of more silo task-based approach where they're kind of working for a bit of work then they maybe go and check TweetDeck too. They glance up all the time and they're always on top of what's going on 
and they're always engaged with. And I think that's had a huge impact in those kind of teams. Yeah, I, I can see how a lot of people within the organization, I think there's a, a, an interesting anecdote from an airline we work with who said their baggage handling team are walking past this screen every day and actually responding and seeing how the job that they do is actually connected to real people on the other end that they might sometimes forget as they go about their daily job. So I mean that brings us to the importance of actually where you put it and you know what screens you use, how, how do you install this thing. So Hans, I'd be interested to know you know how you decided where to put it in the company. You mentioned earlier about a stealth approach, but how did you come to that decision? Well, um, we came to that decision, or I came to that decision as a, yeah, as a background in, in the startup environments, working with a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, and came into a big corporation like IKEA, and I noticed right off the bat when I started here nine months ago that there was just a lot of meetings and a lot of PowerPoints being produced here. So I said to to a manager of mine, I'm like, why don't we just set something up and and they will do like I said to you before, we'll do a bit of a stealth approach to this. So I wanted to I wanted to push things from a bottom up approach, and I know that the the digital maturity uh, overall within IKEA, and I think I'm quite sure when I say for all the different IKEA companies, is not very very high. So I made it really important for myself to to really spread the news and invite people over to the setup that we have right now, but obviously we have not come to the point where we've branded the setup and we have not put screens up in different parts of the office uh, as of right now. These are things that we're discussing currently. So I really wanted to sow the seeds of innovation and creativity and obviously what social business intelligence could mean for each of these stakeholders representing different silos. Yeah, I like the idea of it and actually kind of inviting these people to draw their own conclusions from it. I was wondering if you had any examples of maybe when someone walked past it and a new conversation sprung up or were there any instances of actually... Yes, so I joined the company about nine months ago and uh, what I quickly discovered when I was uh, taking part in a uh, larger, more uh, global social media uh, direction, uh, I found out that there's a lot of different scattered initiatives uh, around the world. and different retailers uh, run social media initiatives on many, many different levels. So the maturity varies quite a bit. Uh, for obvious reasons, we do see IKEA in the USA are quite forward thinking in general when it comes to social media. Uh, somewhat closely followed by the Dutch organization, to some extent Sweden and also the UK. But in general, there's a lot of different scattered initiatives and we don't have a, any specific homogeneous way of, uh, of working with social business intelligence. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's something we've noticed too. Glenn, I'm not sure if you've seen a difference between different regions in how they approach social media or not. I think I think we do see different differences across the regions, but I think company culture tends to be more important. I mean, most companies are so global and large anyway, but I do think you see a difference between more between the European, um, the Eastern, and then the American types of countries. Seeing the real effect that the command center can have. Absolutely. Uh, that's happening ongoing uh, and it's it's pretty much everybody that uh, runs around an IT department to come by and show curiosity. And I, I do think this is actually one of the things that most companies should be quite interested in, in focusing on because uh, I mean I think we know that all around the world we have a lot of disengaged employees and I think if you roll out social business intelligence within your company, you have an opportunity for actually employees to also engage with your consumer and your customer base. And I think that's going to make your brand a lot more playful, a lot, a lot more lively, and I think it's going to be more meaningful for the employees and into the work that they're doing on a daily basis. But there was a situation where we, after a couple of months of running this project, uh, had, a, had a discussion with a risk compliance uh, officer uh, at my office. and. He, he proposed, uh, he got interested in an in opportunity to, to, uh, to, do a, 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 to provide a dashboard for him with insights to the Israel-Palestine situation. Uh, IKEA has a, a re retail store in Israel and the situation is such that they are selling obviously furniture uh, products to anybody, but the Palestinians living in occupied territories are not able to bring that across the border back home. So, but the Israelis can do that. So we. Um, actually innovated with you guys at Ramwatch and that was really something special because now we have an opportunity to provide a customized dashboard for a stakeholder in a specific silo 
just bringing real uh, time uh, streaming information relevant to that person's work. So there was an opportunity to show uh, on hand live what people were discussing both in Hebrew and Arabic and English to what was going on uh, both in, on a local level but also on a global level. So providing uh, real uh, important value information to the uh, risk compliance department. Fantastic and I think that kind of um, malleable changing iterative part is actually quite an important factor here because I think we're all pretty clear that social media isn't static, it's a dynamic thing and we have, we have a question from Marco Donadelli who is asking you know what if you do have a distributed team like do you duplicate the screen all in all locations and I just wanted to ask Glenn how big a factor when you're developing something like Visio or thinking about how command centers work is the different places they can be used in a company and, and how big a role does that play in when you're, when you're building something like this? Yeah, it plays a massive one because when we design things at Brandwatch, we don't, we try to think kind of like where, where the future is, where are things going, where are people going to want to take this and we looked around and you look at a lot of the products and they're designed to just be, you know, six screens on the wall uh, in one part of the office and that's it and it can't go anywhere else and we from the very beginning set out to make something that was bringing beautiful visualizations with insight to any screen. So this visit runs in a browser, it works on your iPad, your iPhone, your laptop, screens, works anywhere. And, and in the product there's this kind of concept of virtual screens that you can access. And what we've seen is companies making almost these like customer voice TV channels, these social media channels that they can watch. And you can see uh, people who have kind of created these, so their CEO logs into his iPad and he sees the latest conversation going on for his brand, but then other people are logging in on their laptops as well. So it's not just locking it to this particular wall, it's taking this data everywhere around the company and treating it as more a way of getting up to date in the same way you watch the news, not just as a kind of reporting thing. So we took all of that into account, so business scales all the way up and down in terms of size, it means it looks great on a big screen and on a small screen, and you can access it from anywhere. And that was really important when we thought about what the future is. Because I expect a lot of companies bring this in as a command center. Once other people see it, they're going to say, I want it. And the great thing is with Vizio, they can. They can just take it away then and there and go look at it um, wherever they are in the workplace. Yeah, I mean, I think that answers it you know, pretty much nail on the head there. Um, and the fact that so many different teams could be using this is paramount, really. But what do you do when you have these insights, Han? So if you think you have an interesting insight that maybe a team might like to see but haven't seen it yet, is there a way to distribute these kind this information across the business? That's a good question, you know, and I'm actually still thinking about what what, what would be the best way to do this. Uh, I have, since I've set this up, and uh, uh, I've been able to get in contact with a couple of different retailers, specifically ones in uh, the Dutch organization but also in the U.S., and in um, in the UK, and you know, having conversations with media specialists represented from these different markets have enabled me to share some of the reports uh, with these people because it's really important that everything that we do here at the Intercare Systems Office is that are things that will support the retail business. That's why we exist. So I'm slowly and surely still trying to figure out. Uh, you know what the best way is to share this information and right now we are still sending PDF reports to these retailers and uh, getting engaged with them and developing a, a good communication in regard to the needs that they have on a local market and how we could further work to support them on a daily basis in the social business intelligence space. Sure, so I mean are you seeing it as something that you're provoking teams into thinking about this more deeply? Someone, um, Erica has asked us um, do you train employees specifically on how to use the command center or how to derive these social insights themselves or do you see it more as a prompt? Uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that IKEA is still a bit of an analog company and although that we do, although we do see the IKEA in the, in the US are, tend to be a lot more forward in the social business space, social media business space than other retailers, they are still lagging a little bit behind. In the U.S. right now, they don't have a full-blown command center. They have been working with producing different different types of insights reports. So one of the things that I'm working really hard on at the moment is trying to set the framework for how we could, from this office here, how we could support them in developing and building their own command centers. You know, so it's important to really kind of give them give them tools and give them a certain know-how and 
start to push them in the right direction, you know, and start to feed different types of generic reports that we're producing, so they get different insights. We'll, we'll uh, get them thinking into different uh, potential action plans that they could uh, deploy on a local base. Yeah, I mean that makes sense to me. Um, and actually, another question has just come off the back of what you were saying um, from Heidi, who is asking um, what type of employee do you suggest monitors the feed? Um, do you think they need analyst training in order to assess the credibility, intent, and trends, or do you think there's another way of setting that up, Glenn? I think I think it totally depends on on the use case, right? If you're if you're working in customer service, uh, you know you need to, you need to know a little bit about the kind of conversation coming in, what you deal with certain complaints, and if you're working in sales and you're looking for leads, it's different. So I think it totally depends on why the information matters you, to you, and going back to those business cases. Um, the the great thing with this stuff is I think if you're someone that's uh, kind of the director in terms of what's on those screens. You can kind of have a few trained people that know when to put the right thing up at the right time. They're sending messages out that kind of annotate what's going on. Then everyone else doesn't really need training. I mean, the great thing about this kind of data is it's easy to understand, easy to access. So I think you know there isn't much training that you need to be able to understand what's going on. It's more about it's more about putting it in the right places and making sure it fits the people that are going to be seeing it. Yeah, um, and I mean ultimately you want senior people to see it and understand it because that's how you um, kind of pr uh, evolve this whole process and get deeper and closer to being a social intelligent business. And a real key or a, you know something that you need to unlock to be able to advance that is the C-level buy-in. So Philippe has asked, did the C-level of IKEA ask about the ROI of a command center? And I wondered whether that was a target for you, Hans, or do you see that as the next level of what you're trying to achieve? No, the, uh, the C-level suite of people in IKEA, I think they barely even know how to create a Facebook account, to be honest with you. So it's, uh, it's really just all about, you know, I mentioned that earlier on, that it was really, I put a lot of emphasis on bringing these people in on a one-to-one -one basis and trying to, develop a, trying to develop a foundation for providing a good understanding of what different busy dashboards that we have produced, what it actually meant. So we, we talked about all the visualization of the data and we spoke about how I, my experience, how I know different companies are, are using it. So there were no specific measurements there. There's been no discussions in regard to return of investment. Right now, the biggest work lays in, in trying to get as many people and obviously uh, people high up to really understand what a social business intelligence setup uh, uh, like this, what it could provide for a business in a brand like IKEA. And that's not something that you turn around in two weeks of time. That takes um, a little bit of uh, James Bond work and uh, a little bit of uh, persistency and tenacity. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. And I think it's something that is going to be very hard for a lot of organizations. I know. A couple of companies we work with are lucky enough to have a CEO that has gone for a digital first strategy, whereas other, it kind of has to come from the other end. Absolutely, you you do see that, uh, you know, that in C-suite level uh, of um, uh, people, the the, the more um, technology prone that they are, the easier it will be to have uh, things of this nature deployed within an organization. Uh, so we're seeing a little bit of lack of that. You know, there's a little bit of, um, from an IKEA point of view, there's a little bit of. Um, I think people are to some extent a little bit scared in regard to, okay, what does all this mean to us? Uh, how do we push this out? You know, what can we control? Uh, because everybody knows that bad news travels really fast online. So I think people are a little bit afraid uh, in regard to, you know, what if we do something that has a negative effect online? So people are asking broad questions uh, like that in general. So. I think it's important to develop good conversations around social business intelligence on a macro level initially, and then just to continuously educate and engage all the C-suite level people in regard to what different tools and what it connects that they can do for a brand or for a company. Because obviously we have different objectives that we want to reach uh, in our office, and it's to expand and build the customer base of IKEA. We want to continue obviously supplying different products at the lowest price possible out there and we want to strengthen and position the IKEA brand uh, better for the future. So kind of vague description right now, but those are the objectives that we have. And obviously we know, I know that, you know, leveraging different uh, opportunities on, on the social business arena can help uh, satisfy those objectives. So now it's just kind of like translating that into 
specific possible actions uh, from from the officer. I think that's really interesting in that uh, a lot of the companies that I've seen that have signed up and are using Physia, you know, there is sometimes um, some resistance from some of the C-suite, or they don't really understand what this thing is, right? They're trusting their guys, and it's going to be interesting useful to them, but they don't see how it's going to transform the rest of the business or how this data can really make a difference. But what I've seen is how quickly that has turned around with, with just uh, a few of the, the most skeptical kind of clients that is on board. And it was often as simple as they just handed the CEO an iPad with, with some visualizations on or set a screen up outside his office and he couldn't avoid it. And it's, it's really not hard to understand this data. When you see it, it's really not hard to understand how it can have such an impact on your understanding of your customers. And I think, I think all CEOs really do care about their customers and what they're saying. And I think you know, this gives you direct access to that. And that's where I've seen companies creating this almost social media TV channel where they have even someone directing and curating a screen just for the CEO, putting messages on there to tell him what's going on, changing the visualizations as the day progresses, as the conversation progresses. So I think it can be really transformative in terms of them understanding why social data can have such an impact on their business. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a powerful way of getting a message across and kind of invites the next level too. So if social media is pushing this agenda and trying to get it right up at the top of the company, What's next? Like, what other data sources could we use? So, Hans, I'd, I'd be interested to know what you think the future of this kind of thing is. If we're having this conversation in three to five years' time, what are we going to be talking about? Oh, that's a good question, Joel. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer that one, but uh, I mean, <laughs> Ikea's, Ikea's, uh, Ikea's facing a bunch of different challenges at this point in time. And one of the things that we have uh, found out uh, through uh, regular research is that we have a, a somewhat decline in uh, brand perception on the different mature markets. Uh, and that's obviously a, a big red flag for us. We're doing a sl we, see do, we do see some uh, slight decline in sales in the, some of the mature uh, markets as well. So it's all about trying to get up you know, to, to launch Kia 2.0. And I think that uh, a really good way to, to to present the different types of useful information is obviously to dig into the social space on a larger scale than what we've done right now. So, you know, if we talk in three to five years, I, I think it would be great to uh, have a conversation around the different benefits that we're seeing in a local level, you know, with fully blown command centers. And it's all about, for me, it's all about uh, making uh, different retailer stores uh, in their respective PMA. PMA is a primary market area, it's the different. Uh, it's the different geography that the retail stores operate within. And having the employees engaged on a local basis and creating a one-to-one, -one, building those relationships with the customer and the consumer base. And you know, IKEA's biggest challenge is also, I think, with any large corporation who has, uh, IKEA has been around for 60 years, something years now. And uh, it, it, the sales have been performing really well. Uh, you know, there's never been, we've always had consistent good growth in a profitable business. And it's really, how do you get High-level executives to, to make you know radical decisions when a company is doing well because I think you know most people don't tend to to make uh, drastic decisions or to take bigger risks uh, you know if there is no crisis. So I, I personally hope that we don't have to come to a crisis for things to to um, evolve on a larger global scale for IKEA. I mean we see a lot of opportunities to really uh, to do good things on the social business. Uh, landscape here because of the brand that we represent. I think I think that's interesting. I think the thing that I see is that, you know, we started in social, that's what our background is a business and that's where it made sense with this visualization stuff because it's kind of the most immediate kind of live feedback you can get, right? You post a new ad up, what's the first metric you're going to get? It's not going to be sales, it's going to be people tweeting about how much they love or hate your new ad, right? So that's one of the great things about the immediacy. But in the next three to five years, I don't see how it can stay there because no business works in, in silos like that. No business only looks at one metric, being social or whatever. So I think it's going to be really key how we bring that together. And, and that's where I see this kind of data visualization really making a difference to people when it's bringing together those metrics in one place so they can have it all together. But it's also understanding that on some level and giving them some real insight and feedback based on that. So people can just make the decisions when they need to make them and have the information when they need the information. So I definitely see the future being bringing all these kind of metrics and business things together into a place so that you can understand everything together and make decisions. And, and that sounds 
like a truly social intelligent business where you are bringing in sales data and you're bringing in marketing data and you're using a center of excellence not just for social media but for a kind of holistic approach to business intelligence. So we're actually coming to the end of the time for this webinar. We will be following up with the recording and the slides like I mentioned earlier, but please do allow me to thanks so much for seeing the actual practice side of this kind of conversation from Hans in the Netherlands and from Glenn here in the UK. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for joining. Thank you.